Hi, my name is David Bruce. Most of us have heard about how painting was changed forever by the arrival of photography. But how has the arrival of electronic and digital technology affected music? Well, today I thought I'd look at the way composers have used or been inspired by electronic and digital techniques in the music they've written for acoustic instruments. There was a fun example of this recently on Rob Scallon's channel, where he recreated a digital delay with live musicians. There's something captivating about the idea because you're taking a process that you would normally expect a machine to do and you're asking a human to do it instead. There was an element of this in my recent piece Side Chaining which I'll talk about briefly but you might be surprised to know that Rob's idea goes quite a long way back and I found some really great examples of composers mimicking everything from EQ to ring modulation. You can think of many electronic effects as essentially forms of orchestration. Take EQ for example. EQ is like a more detailed volume control that allows you to control the levels of different frequencies of sound. So let's look at an individual instrument like this solo horn note. When we play it in this frequency analyzer you can see each of the upper harmonics the note has. And by playing with the EQ we can make different harmonics stand out more or less, changing the quality of the instrument's tone. So to achieve a similar effect, you might try using other instruments to emphasize those harmonics. There's a quite famous example of this in the orchestral repertoire, which predates any of these technologies by quite some time. It's Ravel's Bolero, written in 1928. So you can see the main theme is on the horn, and it's doubled on the celeste and two piccolo flutes. The doubling exactly matches the overtone series of the horn. So it's like Ravel is amplifying the natural harmonics the horn has. So you end up with this unusual situation where the top piccolo is actually playing in a different key to the rest of the orchestra. It's a sort of 1920s EQ. A more extreme example can be heard in this amazing piece by Claude Vivier called Lonely Child. Here the soprano's line is surrounded by a haze of harmonics. Vivier was connected with a group of composers known as the Spectral Composers and we'll come back to them later. You'll notice when I used the digital audio software to change the EQ, I was able to swipe along gradually changing the tone. This swiping effect, which surely originates in that gradual tweaking of the control knob, has become commonplace in orchestral music since the 1950s. Here it is in Ligeti's amazing atmosphere of 1961. It's a bit more subtle, but I really like the way Ligeti also uses this effect in his chamber concerto, probably his best piece in my opinion. To me, the staggered fade-in of the winds really does feel like someone's tweaking that EQ. For composers of Ligeti's generation, it was of course a pre-digital age. The technology that probably influenced them most was the magnetic tape. Composers have been experimenting with magnetic tape machines since Peter Schaeffer in the 1940s, and many of course have written pieces specifically for them. This is Terry Riley's Music for the Gift from 1963, where he effectively sampled a Chet Baker recording and looped it in a phasing pattern where one version of the recording gradually shifts out of sync with another. But it was Steve Reich, the father of American minimalism, who was one of the first composers to think of transferring these techniques that had been developed with tape machines into pieces that were written for a live performance. Here's his piece Piano Phase, and now rather than the tape machine, it's the turn of two pianists to gradually slip the gears. Another tape technique is known as the reinjection loop. Alvin Lucia pioneered the idea with his 1969 sound art piece I Am Sitting in a Room. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. Lucia recorded himself narrating a text. The recording was then played back and re-recorded and the process was repeated. I am sitting in a room. I am sitting in a room. 
I am sitting in a room. Each time the text becomes less and less clear. The resonant frequencies of the room are amplified until essentially that's all that's left. It's quite a thought-provoking effect. You're taking something human and gradually dehumanizing it gradually draining it of life and meaning until you're left with a cold, sterile sound. To me, it speaks to the terrifying side of technology, but it's an interesting process in its own right, and one that clearly spoke to composers like Tristan Murai and George Frederick Haas, both of whom have written re-injection style pieces. Haas's string quartet number four starts with a single note, and as it's played back into itself, its overtones gradually distort eventually twisting into strange, lightly pulsing figurations. I'm not exactly clear whether Haas's approach was computer-assisted, but it certainly gives a similar feeling of gradual disintegration to the Lucia. Tristan Murai, another of the so-called spectral composers, adds a solo horn in his version, Memoir Erosion, and the echoes of its line in the ensemble gradually distort more and more until the whole thing ends up in chaos. The distortion in both pieces is far richer and more human than Lucia's, although there's still something quite cold and impersonal about both pieces. They form an interesting comparison to the processes of someone like Steve Reich, whose, whose music always maintains a sense of humanity, warmth and fun. To me, these pieces are a little austere. This kind of reinjection loop is a feedback mechanism. The playback of something with itself causes all sorts of unexpected effects and distortions. And although my next example isn't a composition, it's a wonderful example of what can be achieved with real instruments to make a distorted or feedback-like effect. Lou Reed's Metal Machine Music, which I mentioned in my video about noisy music, features an entire album of distorted electric guitar effects and noise. And this is the German new music group Zeitgratz's arrangement of the album for live instruments, including whatever this guy is scraping on the piano strings. Speaking personally, I prefer the Zeitgratzer version to the original. It has the extra thrill of live performance, but it also has that extra provocation of an electronically created sound, the original distortion, being recreated and humanized in performance. My next example might surprise you, it might even strike you as a cheat, but it certainly struck me as a digital kind of effect when I first heard it. Many keyboards, especially smaller ones like this one, have an octave shifting button, which constantly transposes everything I play up or down an octave. So I can play this melody and shift the octave as I play. Now here's the original, the same tune I just played. It's a cheat because it's another pre-electronic piece. It was written in 1901. It's a lesser known piece by Charles Ives called Largo. And the first time I heard it, I really did feel like Ives had deliberately octave displaced the melody. Even if he didn't know anything about digital technology, it's still a very cool effect. Ring modulation is probably best known from the sound of the Daleks in Doctor Who. You will move ahead of us and follow my directions. And ring modulation takes two signals and creates two new signals from them that are the sum and the difference of those two original signals. You can see it most easily with a sine wave at 440 hertz. If you add another note an octave higher at 880, the result will be two new waves. One that is the addition, so 1320, and one that is the difference, so 440. So you'll have two notes, one that in this case happens to be the same as the original note, and one two and a half octaves higher. That's ring modulation at its most basic, but you can imagine if you start dealing with more complicated sounds, the sounds of real instruments, things can get very complicated very quickly. 
But this was just the sort of thing that ECAM, the Institut de Recherche et Coordination Acoustique Musique in Paris, was set up to look into. ECAM developed the IMAX MSP real-time audio processing environment, but it also allowed numerous leading composers to come and work and explore new technologies, and it was where that spectral school of composers came together. One of the number was Gerard Grise, and his magnum opus Les Espaces Acoustiques took him 11 years to write, and much of it translates the acoustic properties of ring-modulated sound into a live orchestra. I do think if you listen closely, you can hear a hint of Dalek in these chords. There's no doubt that the spectral composers took their technological inspiration seriously. Their pieces often have this cold technological sheen. Some of the current generation of composers wear the influence of technology more lightly. Nicole Lisey is inspired by the glitches of analogue devices. And Andrew Norman often uses the sense of stopping, starting and interruption you find in video games to inspire his writing. Finally, let me finish off with the example I mentioned from my own piece, Side Chaining, which imitates the digital process of So sidechaining is the process whereby the sound on one channel will affect the sound on another. The opening string and wind chords effectively sidechain each other, each one cutting the other off. But I added an extra layer of the effect when the brass and the percussion stabs come in. The upper parts of the chords beneath are cut off to make room for the brass. So I suppose it's a mixture of a sidechain and another EQ effect. Again, I really felt there was something thrilling about the huge sound of a live orchestra having its volume button turned up and down as if by some giant hand from above. And for me, that's what's so fascinating about this whole area. It's an interesting way of straddling the technological divide, humanizing a potentially soulless effect. But apart from anything else, it's just good fun. Thanks so much to my wonderful patrons on Patreon who support the channel and make these videos possible. Here's the link if you're interested in joining them. Do please like and subscribe and share with your friends. I'll see you next time.